Hello, Zero K fans. This is Shadow Fury CC3 with another analysis stream. It's gonna be analysis on a match between Anarchid and Flipstip played on iced coffee a few days ago. And this map is a map that I think I might have shown a few times, but let's go over it slightly. For the most part, this map is fairly straightforward. It's a kind of smallish square map. There's start bases, top and bottom. There's basically a ramp here, but there's also rather subtler ramp on the back. If you go down the back here, there is a ramp, and similarly with the north side. As well, every metal spot except for the two here at the center, they are all plus two. The two in the center are plus 3.5, as can be clearly seen. And apart from that, it's definitely a map that I've seen air play on. I've seen a lot of cloaky general bot play. Vehicles don't really work. Pretty much everything else does, though hovers could theoretically work fairly well with the water. However, normally what I see here is Cloaky, Jump Bot, occasionally Shield Bot. This match, we have Anarchid going for Cloaky Bot, no surprises there, while Flipstip goes for Amphib. Makes sense with the water, though the Amphibious Bots don't necessarily work ideally. The water wasn't designed around Amphibious Bots, something that should probably be cleaned up at some point. However, we'll see how Flipstip deals with that, with where they put their bots just to try to deal with that the underwater terrain is not really set up for any amphibious bots. I mean, it can work in theory, it's just not really set up for it. And with, without further ado, let's start the game! So Anarchid is probably going to start out with Gremlin as usual. Let's start starting out with a couple ducks. Anarchid likes to go for an early Gremlin, either before or after their three glaives, because they want to get a Gremlin into their opponent's base to just keep an eye on everything. It's something Anarchy does every game, so if you play against Anarchy, keep that in mind. Set up some Glaives or other cheap Raiders, have them go around your base, and yep, that's the first unit built is a Gremlin. Now, Flipstep on the other hand, going for a couple ducks into a conch, actually four ducks into a conch. Not terribly unusual, though four ducks, yeah, 80 metal each, that's, that's typical. A little bit higher than I'd expect. Similarly, Anarchy is going for five Glaives before a single Conjurer. Both players are basically figuring that this is going to be a very aggressive game, starting out with their early units quickly. So, given that, if we consider the way that Flipstip has their stuff set up, they have... Like, right now, they have plus 10 metal. They just got plus 10. A couple wind generators as well, which are doing just fine. All plus 215. I mean, they vary, but right now they're fine. And no easy way to expand. Anarchid, in a similar position, though, Glaives are cheaper. No... No Conjures have come up yet, and the Gremlin, that really first, that first Gremlin is very expensive. Halfway across the map so far, Anarchy is just about, well, it's a really nice position here. As you can see, it's not going to work directly, but the Gremlin can end up on top of this little purple section, and as a result, be able to see what's going on inside the base. That is still fairly important. While well, Anarchy continues to build out, and from here, not really much is going to be that unusual. Flips is going to be trying to harass. Anarchid's actually going for a scythe. Anarchid is... Anarchid has built a conjurer, but is going for scythe right away. Which is a tad surprising. Not for Anarchid, just in general. For Anarchid, it's actually fairly typical. For, in general, it's a little bit surprising. For obvious reasons. And actually, I should point out that Flipstep, having done some raiding with the ducks, threw them into the water to heal them up. Which is a thing that amphibs can do. Always good to keep that in mind. Your amphibious bots can move into the... They can move into the water to heal up. It's never bad to, for, to remember that because that is something that they are going to need. If there's any water on the map, drop the amphibs into that so they self-heal quickly. Although for now, Flipstep unable to really do any damage. So from here, Flipstep kind of has a few options. They can build up, try to build defensively, take their top half of the map. They can continue trying to poke in from multiple angles, which they do have ducks set up to do, but at this point, the ducks can't really do too much. There are a lot of defenders around. There are a lot of stag defense built up inside of Anarchid's base. And Anarchid's commander itself has a ride cannon on it, so dealing with that directly is not an option. Or they can basically just try to keep Anarchid contained. Like poke around the edges. So not so much defensive play as just building up the north side, but more specifically trying to make sure that they're aware of what Anarchid's up to. Now Anarchid, on the other hand, having the scythe is going to be rather hard to contain. That scythe able to get rid of the duck that was to the north reducing Flipstip's attack options a little bit, not all that much, in all honesty. Flipstip hadn't really set up too much. Right now, Flipstip appears to be going much more on the defensive side, 
trying to build up their territory, which, like I said, Anarchy has total awareness of. So right now, if we look at Anarchid's point of view, Anarchid... Actually, never mind. No, Anarchid doesn't. This gremlin is in a pretty bad spot. Doesn't actually see the factory. Sees a few units moving around here and there, but it's important to note, this gremlin's actually doing nothing. So Anarchid unable to make any use of that gremlin, which is a bit of a shame, given that that's something they do all the time for this sort of information, but nope, not this time. Not gonna work. And Flipstep actually looks like they are trying to go for multi-pronged assault, sending ducks over the west side of the map. On the east side of the map, Anarchid does have radar, does know about these ducks coming along here. Doesn't know about the ones over to the southeast, however. They're just outside of radar range, so there's no spotting those in the moment. Anarchid probably is guessing that they're over there, however. But honestly, they could be underwater. For all Anarchid knows, they could be underwater, they could be... Like, there's several bodies of water around here they could be in. But Anarchid has... I'm just gonna pause this for a second, just to really go over this stuff. So Anarchid right now, getting some ticks. I mean... Think about it, that makes sense. There's a lot of raiding going on. They see that Flipstep is trying to send units around, doesn't know where Flipstep is necessarily going to go. Setting up a few ticks here and there is going to allow Anarchid to have an easy time just dealing with them wherever they come in. Has also gone for quite a few Rockos and Moyers, kind of going away, well, gone away from Glaives completely at this point. There are only these two Glaives, that's all Anarchid has, nothing else. Flipstep, on the other hand, they are going for now, boys, and like I said, the Gremlin doesn't really matter, so there's nothing. Anarchid's seeing that Flipstep is doing that Flipstep is actually giving away, so Anarchid's not responding to Flipstep. And the boy... The boy will counter the warrior. The Glaives would do fairly well against the boy, though. The boy is actually rather fast in his fire rate, so it's not that easily countered by Glaives, but it still, broadly speaking, is countered by them. Now, given the situation, Flipstep looks pretty keen to continue along. They're getting their, getting their economy built up, they do have a duck over here, so they're either going to try to expand over here, try to contest that, or continue expanding. It looks like most likely going to continue expanding down the south side. Now, this duck here try to prevent anything from coming in to deal with that expansion over to the southwest side, while Anarchid's commander is over to the northeast, so trying to contest the eastern side of the map is going to be fairly tricky. Flipstep might be able to pull that off, but they have to be really careful in doing so. If they're able to snipe the commander, that would just end this completely. The entire east side would be open to Flipstep, and that would actually be a very game-changing thing. At the moment, the game is fairly even. Both players basically have their, like, northwest, southeast corner. They're building up along the side. Anarchid does have the high-power metal extractor before Flipstep has the corresponding one on the opposite side of the map. Otherwise, though, there really isn't too much to be said differently. Flipstep probably going to expand down here. Anarchid is probably going to expand up here. However, Anarchid does have that scythe. Now, this scythe alone, that's a lot of interesting decisions that can be made here. So the scythe could be going over to the main base to try to take care of caretakers. I mean, we are dealing with the stage of the game where caretakers are going to start being built. We're at the plus 20 hump, or very nearly. Throwing a scythe in there to completely destabilize the economy around the plus 20 hump might be a little bit early. Doing it around plus 30 or plus 40 is much more effective and completely shutting down your opponent's production. But we might see that anyway. Anarchid is fond of building several sides, so just using one, throwing it in here, just to kill something. Killing a caretaker is not a bad idea. And of course, at this position, it could actually be used for a factory swap. Wouldn't be surprised if we saw that from Flipstip. Otherwise, Anarchid seems to be just going for building at the main base and being semi-defensive. Anyway, continuing on, Anarchid currently leaving that scythe alone. Not doing anything with it yet. Flipstep has not actually... I oh, just started the Caretaker. And the Scythe is apparently intending to go around. Looks like intending to go on the ramp, possibly as a defense. At the same time, we have a battle in the center, which, to no surprise, Anarchid wins. Flipstep did not have the units to deal with that at all. Now fully aware was there, and of course, now fully aware there is an army that is essentially marching through to where Flipstep is attempting to expand. Well, Flipstep's Scythe gets in here, and the Duck does not block it. However, the Scythe in a fairly inopportune position, all things considered. Very easy for Flipstep's forces to deal with this. In fact, this boy is about to decloak that Scythe right now. There we go, that Scythe gets decloaked. And boy, it's a wonderful counter to the Scythe. That Scythe is going to go down with no damage dealt whatsoever. It's like some minor repairs to deal with that. Actually, that boy just goes in the water and it's fine. Anarchid, on the other hand, pretty much taking the southwest side of the map, or at least taking some soft control over it and the northeast as well, so Anarchid in a very safe spot right now. They haven't quite taken advantage of it, they're just starting to set up there a bit. 
more denying Flipstip than anything else at this point. The Northeast, however, Anarchid has taken. Flipstip looks to be trying to deny that, but it's going to be rather tricky. All they can really do right now is deny the harassment path along the north side. So nothing can come up this north side of the base. Wise thing to do in general, but Anarchid is taking all the juicy metal extractors that I'm sure Flipstip would very much love to have. And Flipstip, Flipstip knows this. Flipstip is well aware of where Anarchid has set themselves up. Well aware of at least some of the forces that are over here in the southwest side of the map. Not all of them, mind you. Not... Well, okay. Most of them, yeah. I mean, the rock was here. The rest of them are kind of known. They aren't on radar, but they are known about. And ducks do not do well against warriors, unfortunately. Not one-on-one, -on -one, at least. Of course, warriors are about three times the cost of ducks, so it's not like three ducks wouldn't do especially well. It's just one duck? No, not going to happen. The boy, on the other hand, definitely the counter here, so Flipstep going to have no problem dealing with that, but still it's going to be... Well, dealing with that warrior, everything else is going to be a bit iffy. And Anarchid's commander continuing to move in. It is level 1, upgrading to level 2 for the Riot Cannon. And at this point, Anarchid moving very strongly in here, so Flipstep right now... Checking their build queue. They're getting a Grizzly very soon. This is a little bit risky. They have plus 30, but they are kind of spreading it out. They have their flip, they have the commander going over here, spending 10 of it over to just build metal extractors, build metal extractor overdrive support buildings. Well, there's only one caretaker at home, and the Grizzly wisely being cancelled because there really isn't enough money or at least not enough build power at home to deal with that. While Anarchid's commander here, Flipstip. Their choices essentially are build up a bunch of skirmishes to deal with this, or try to finish that grizzly in the two minutes it would take before the commander goes up the ramp and tries to attack directly. And they're definitely going for that former option. Getting skirmishers and riots to deal with the commander. Forcing Anarchid back a bit. Now, Anarchid does have a sharpshooter, has not gone for yet another scythe. Going straight for sharpshooters, which, given that it is plus 24 for them, they can assume flipstep is around plus 24, plus 25 as well. So they can assume that Flipstep is going to be going for heavy units, which is partially true. I mean, boys are heavy enough units that sharpshooters make sense. Sharpshooters do 1500 damage, boys have 1250 health. So boys are one shot by them, as we will soon see right now with this boy right here. Well, as soon as it gets into view. There we go. As demonstrated by the sharpshooter, boys do not last particularly long against them. It is the direct counter. However, there are quite a few boys on the field right now. So at the moment, if we just pause to check, right now, Anarchy is investing a lot of their money into their commander. They've just about gotten level 2. In fact, I'm not going to I'm going to check when level 2 is done, but I'm not going to be paused then. Flips everything in their hand, staying at level 1. Both players have... Actually, Flips went for a strike comm, while Anarchy went for a battle comm. So Anarchy is definitely much more keen on going for the comm push. Flips up, on the other hand, just wants to have that safe push. I mean, the thing is, this map is small. There are choke points, but otherwise it's actually fairly easy to get around, so throwing conches around the map is an easy way to get them killed. It's difficult to completely defend them. It's kind of hard to consolidate the map. As we can see, both players have actually set up a lot of defenses, as is. And even that's going to be rather risky, because when you set up these defenses, your opponent can obviously build up offensive units. There are already sharpshooters in play. Hammers wouldn't be too hard to build up either, and could probably come up from here, too, if the defenses are built far enough south. So Flipstip right now, a little bit cautious, but yeah, they definitely went for the build-up in a defensive fashion option when we were talking earlier. And they're now also getting that Grizzly. It'll take about a minute. A little long, but that's actually not too bad, all things considered. Yeah, they have 25 build power going into it, so that is gonna, that's going to speed it up a fair amount. Now, Anakin, on the other hand, starting to be forced back, has already lost one of their metal extractors. And Flipstep right now, if you look at their overall units, they actually have a much bigger army overall. Flipstep, they don't have as concentrated an army as Anarchid. Now, the Grizzly is going to change this a lot, but Anarchid right now has Sharpshooter, that's 750 metal. Their Commander, that's another 1275, which will soon be somewhere around 2,000. Or, well, somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 in a couple sec, well, like 10 seconds or so. And otherwise, in terms of the more bread-and-buttered units, this is it. And one of those warriors is in production, by the way. That's their B&B &B units. Three Rockos and two Warriors. Compared to Flipstep, who right now has... Right now... I kind of wish you could not select workers. Right now, 14 bread and butter units, along with the Grizzly being built up fairly soon, and... Conch count, four conches to, I think, one or two conjurers. Two conjurers. 
So Anarchid is very much reliant on their commander. If that commander gets killed, Anarchid's going to be very much behind. I don't think Felizip is going to focus on that, however. They are setting up for more of a flank of this entire expansion. They'll get the commander if they time it right, which I think they will. I don't think it's going to be easy for Anakin to get out of that. Anakin's actually overextending quite a lot. Their commander is far too far forward. They do have just another auto repair system, which in the current version doesn't actually work as well as the previous versions. Or rather, in 1.2.11, which, I mean, that was released weeks ago. The auto repair module was nerfed a fair bit. It only works after a commander's been out of combat for several seconds. I believe it's still 10. It was originally 10. It might have been changed, but it... It doesn't work in combat. That's the important thing. And Anarchy going for the west side of the map, trying to harass that out fairly well. Well, on the same time, Flipstep just going out to the south side of the map, and Anarchy I mean, trying to punish Flipstep for overextending in the same way that Anarchy has been. This is actually really dangerous, too, because the sharpshooter here completely unspotted. Flipstep's command. Can Anarchy see it? Anarchy cannot see it except on radar, and the sharpshooter fires off on a defender, not on the commander. But the sharpshooter will not likely be decloaked before the commander is spotted. However, the commander is behind this hill, so the sharpshooter cannot see it. Cannot get clear line of sight on that commander. At the same time, Anarchid's commander, however, is being surrounded. Boys on all sides. Stinger is trying to deal with this. And a tick as well to try to help out, which actually is somewhat helpful, but not as much as it would seem. And Aner Flipstep's commander does successfully escape. Gets behind the solar wall. However, Flipstep does lose that high power metal extractor. While Anarchid, on the other hand, their commander is very much alive. Their commander is, in fact, morphing once again. And the high power metal extractor is also alive. So Flipstep right now, not in an easy spot to push forward. They finally have made those southeast ducks do something. But even then, they're going to kill a worker. That's actually pretty good when you consider the fact that there's, like, well, three workers now. Oh, oh never mind. A lot of conjures have been built. Anarchid has been switching very much to conjure production. Looks like just trying to power the factory forward. That's that's a good idea. They've actually kind of... They were accessing metal a little bit earlier, and they have been at that plus 20 hump a bit. And I call it that because when you get to plus 20 metal, you very... It's kind of a newbie mistake, but it's something that can happen if you're not paying attention, is you forget to build your caretaker, or a second factory, but usually caretaker. And so you forget to actually use that metal that you're getting. And since plus 20 is the first time you have to go from just factory to factory plus caretaker, that tends to be the hardest one. Anything past that, plus 30, plus 40, any other plus 10 increment, it's usually by that time you've got in your head that you need caretakers. Sometimes I find plus 40, plus 50, that problem crops up once again. Because building two or three caretakers is fairly simple, but then after they have to think about it. So you might forget it then. But yeah, definitely plus 20. Pretty much every game, if you're not careful, you will not remember to put that caretaker down at plus 20 metal or thereabouts. And thus you'll get excessing metal. Important thing to keep in mind. Now at the same time... Okay, regardless of that, that advice is over. Now we're back to the game, and Anarchid going for an air switch. Let's pause this once again, because the situation has changed quite a lot. Anarchid actually lost their commander I was, as I was discussing the finer points of dealing with metal excess. I forgot about the actual commander being killed by the Grizzly. So Flipsip's Grizzly is out. Flipsip's so Grizzly is going along the east side of the map and terrorizing the entire east side of the map, while the west side of the map actually has not gone down completely. The metal extractor has been rebuilt. Flipsip's commander has been able to move forward. The sharpshooter remains in play. Though it's currently not able to attack, but that's pretty brief. And Flipstep's forces are basically dealing with Anarchid's air switch effectively. They already had ducks, they're decent anti-air, and Flipstep as well morphing their commander. Flipstep had so many defenders already, it's kind of surprising that they weren't... I mean, they weren't really considered apparently by Anarchid, because that number of defenders makes an air switch rather impractical. Especially after losing the commander, that's a lot of economy gone. That's a lot of build power gone. The switch to all these conjurers, not a bad idea, but even then. Even with seven conjurers, that's going to be difficult to deal with that. There's some reclaim here that's not really even in Anarchid's territory. Anarchid's lost his territory here. This is going to go very badly for Anarchid very shortly. So Anarchid, what they might do from here... I mean, they have sharpshooters, so their anti-heavies are covered as far as dealing with the grizzly goes. The grizzly's only at... It's 9,000 health. So that's six shots from a sharpshooter. But otherwise, yeah, those ravens didn't really make much sense. Alika would almost make sense. So that's a lot of metal to be powering into something. That'd be a minute and a half or so before that's finished. But so Alika would kind of make sense against the grizzly. It's definitely escalating in the right direction. Or it could be used to get rid of the bread and butter units. And we also see the scythe over to the northwest. So Anarchid deciding to go instead for sneaky tactics. Scythe in the northwest. Raven around the map to deal with what it can. Although admittedly, like I said, there's a lot of anti-air. 
and I guess other than that, some defenses, there's some, some stingers. Anakid's kind of flailing a bit. I mean, they're, they invested so much money into their defender, sorry, into their commander. Like at that point, they would have invested, let's see, 775 in morph plus whatever else, probably at least 200 to 300. So they invested at least a thousand metal of morph in that commander. That's a lot of units. Given that they're playing Cloaky, that's like 20 ish glaives. Or given that they're going for Rocco Warrior combo, that's five warriors or about 10, Rock 10 to 12 Roccos. That would have actually helped a bit against the Grizzly. That would have helped a bit, quite a bit against all the bread and butter units that have been built so far, because, I mean, Flipstep having focus on the Grizzly is not focusing on the standard bread and butter, and this Sharpshooter, like I said, already here as a counter. Anarchid was already prepared for this. I mean, obviously, it's very difficult to be fully prepared for a Grizzly, because they do have a lot of health, and more are coming. No, don't you worry about that. There are definitely more coming. And that first one has gone down. Very nicely for Anarchid, too, because that's a lot of reclaim to work from. I mean, Flipstep basically donated about 800 metal straight to Anarchid. Anarchid very much enjoys that, getting another Sharpshooter out, because of course there are going to be more Grizzlies, and even then, the Sharpshooters are doing just fine against the boys. They are a good choice against Amphibs. So Anarchid definitely making the right choice there, but unfortunately, as far as their tactical choices have been good, their strategic choices have not been working out so well. Like I said, the loss of that commander and the high focus on the commander for their own spending, that has cost them a lot, having simply lost the commander. Now Flipstep has that as Reclaim, and that entire east side of the map is open. Anarch is trying to re-get it, re-acquire it. But that's a that's a real blow. Very difficult to deal with. Now at the same time, Anarch is trying to creep forward using stingers. And I really don't agree with this. There's just so much going on in the map right now. I mean, this stinger's about to die, not even be finished. One of the conjurers going with it. And Flipsip's commander is getting targeted. It will actually go will it go down? It will not go down. Flipsip's commander will not go down. Two of the Ravens will go down, however, and the Sharpshooter is trying to finish the job the Ravens could not, but Flips his commander moving to the safety of all these defenders. He has 24 defenders. Of those, all but four belong to Flipstep. That's... That's some defense there, but yeah, Flipstep making themselves very unassailable. And at this point... What could Anarchid do? So Anarchid, from a click about factory perspective, I mean, the Shardy Protruders, good plan, especially with the second Grizzly coming in. From here, though, if they're able to reclaim enough, I could actually see Aliko being semi-useful for bunker busting, base busting, like this. Alikos wouldn't even be that useful. This is almost a job for a t heavy tank switch to a Reaper, or for possibly gunship switch to Brawler, though admittedly having gone for an air switch, that isn't really advisable. Just these defenders are a bit of a pain. That's the problem. Getting rid of the defenders. And having enough anti-heavy firepower, I mean, once, he, once about four or five sharpshooters are up, these grizzlies will do nothing. Like, they will be completely useless. Because they'll be basically one shot by the group of sharpshooters. Take sh six shots, well, seven shots instead of take out a grizzly. Six shots in theory, but it's like seven shots because of the way the damage works in spring. It's not quite exact. But we already have three. So that's three volleys to get rid of a single grizzly. From cloaked units. That remain cloaked at all times. So if Anarchid can keep pushing back these Grizzlies, especially if the Grizzlies fall into Anarchid's territory first, that's a lot of metal that Flipstep is going to be giving away to Anarchid, which Anarchid can then use for something anti-heavy. I mean, I almost want to say Pyros, but I don't think I think this is too many defenders for that. Firewalkers might work. Actually, Firewalkers or a Missile Silo would probably do the trick fairly well. A Missile Silo with Napalm Missiles could tear apart these defender nests no problem. And then from their Sharpshooters take out the Grizzlies, and... Some bread and butter units, some glaives and warriors and rockos, just tear apart everything else, finish everything off. And the grizzly, about half health. There are no conches around to heal it up. So actually, it looks like that was a miss. That was, that was a miss. That was an, a rather unfortunate thing to have happen. But we do have an annihilator coming up. This is not something you see very often in one v one, especially not 16 minutes in. But Anarchid is in a rather desperate position. They basically don't want to get hit. They're going for the raids, they're going for the defenses, they're going for anti-heavy to get rid of these grizzlies. All a little bit reactive, though. Because what they don't have in their territory is all that much reclaim. They're kind of here for the reclaim, I and mean, they can sort of get this. But even then, that's not much. And they kind of have 180, 240, maybe, maybe 300, but this area is not really safe. So yeah, 250-ish metal and reclaim. 
Actually, even this one's not safe. So basically 80. They basically have no reclaim. Which is extremely problematic. They do, however, have, like I said, the Sharpshooters. That's defending fairly nicely. They're getting the Annihilator, which will be extremely useful for helping defend. And that's just about done. The Scythe doing a number on Flipsta's base. Getting rid of more and more Caretakers. But unfortunately, that last Caretaker kill killed the Scythe at the same time. Very important thing to remember. Caretakers do die in a big explosion. They will kill weakened units that are nearby. It's very important to keep that in mind. Because if you don't, then you lose your... I mean, at that point, the Scythe had no chance. There was no way around that. But still, it's rather unfortunate because that wasn't... I mean, Flipstep definitely wants to have as many characters as they can, but if that could have gotten rid of both characters, that would have been wonderful. Yeah, so right now, Anarchid in a very, very defensive position. And Flipstep attacking from both sides, this is this is basically uncounterable. This is pretty much unblockable with what Anarchid has. Anarchid has the three sharpshooters. They have a fourth sharpshooter coming up, but Anarchid is surprisingly not... Okay, have they not been building with these characters, or are the characters just bugged slightly? Because I think they're... Mostly just focusing on building up all this artillery, all these defenses. They aren't really building up anything else, and this defense is going to take way too long. But yeah, the sharpshooter here, they probably could have had about seven or eight sharpshooters, which would have been able to counter the Grizzlies, no problem. And all the defensive units. And the Grizzly nearly shot me in the face. Oh yeah, and of course, as I talk about missile silos, Flipsip has gone and built said missile silo, setting up for this giant napalm strike here. And at this point, actually, Anarchid's not that far behind. There's a lot of wind generators lost, but it's actually not as bad as it looks. Because Anarchid right now has a fusion generator. And probably a few other power plants as well, some soldiers here. But look at Anarchid's power, that's 51 power, that's still not doing too terribly. Unfortunately, that's not quite enough for the Annihilator. Which is a bit of a pain because that Annihilator was actually the only one of the few things keeping Anarchid, sorry, keeping Flipstep's forces out. This is essentially game. From here, Flipstep is just going to keep firing more Napalm missiles. Once again, another Napalm missile in a very inopportune position as well. And that Behemoth is not going to get finished. I mean, everything around here is going to die. All the Conjures here that we're building it up are going to die. That bit of a waste. And everything else, the Anglers getting rid of all the air units. This is game. Yep. That is exactly game. So, important takeaways from this. I mean, the game was largely even up until the point that Anarchid overextended their commander. That morphed to level 3, and even the one to level 2, I'd say, was controversial, but level 3 was completely worthless. At that point, Anarchid probably should have cut their losses, moved back a bit, set up, like, consolidated around here, and then tried to just hold on to this high-value metal extractor, while also trying to push along here, and if they could have trapped Flipstip's commander... They got rid of Flipstep's commander, there would have been a massive economic shift, and also, once again, a build power shift. But then Flipstep was the one able to actually pull that off. Getting rid of Anarchist's commander and taking this entire east side, while also holding on to the western side, except for like two or three minutes out of the game. Well, Anarchid also focused, I think, a bit too much... Well, it was the commander, but it was also... The sharpshooter was a good call. There was nothing wrong with the sharpshooter. As a counter to boys, it does work. I wouldn't recommend anything else because really anything else would have been slowed down to the point that it would have been impractical. Like, sharpshooters were a correct option, and then of course for Grizzlies they work very well. The downside of course being that sharpshooters aren't particularly massable. So maybe mixing them with glaives almost would have been a good idea. I mean there were no scallops in the party, so mixing them with glaives would have basically exploited the fact that Flipstip hadn't actually built any riots. It was all boys and a few ducks here and there, but it was basically just boys. And Glaives, while they don't outright beat boys, they do a pretty good number on them. So that wouldn't have been a bad idea. Otherwise, I think the biggest problem was that this gremlin was not a few Elmos further in. If it was just here, it wouldn't have been detected and it would have seen everything. Granted, Anarchid had some really good reads despite the fact that the Gremlin was not seeing what it needed to see, assuming the replay is correct about the vision ranges. I'm assuming it is. But yeah, despite the fact that it couldn't see anything. Oh yeah, Defenders... Rammer pointed out the Defender Spam. That also doesn't help. Would, would it make Glaives difficult? The Sharpshooters were dealing with that fairly well. That's a good point. Warriors might actually have been a better option. I'm thinking Glaives mostly because of their price. But yeah, Warriors or Rockos might have actually have been a better option to intersperse with the sharpshooters, because the problem is, 
Okay, Zeus I don't totally agree with. Zeus I can source here is talking about, but my th my thinking is cost. Well, okay, hammers maybe. Hammers are a fair bit cheaper. I think they're about 150-ish or so. I had to double check the exact pricing since the factory is a pile of rubble right now. But yeah, sharpshooter and hammer would have been tricky. I I can see Zeus. It's just that Zeus is half the cost of sharpshooter. So Zeus is really not. I don't know. It's hard to intersperse it with sharpshooter. I mean, I can see how you could do it. It just would mean your army is still fairly concentrated. There for a second. Anyway, yeah. The air switch as well. The air switch was another thing that probably... It didn't make sense given this, and that money could have gone to building the Zeus that Reimark's talking about. However, I think, honestly, it wouldn't have... It might have worked if it had been Napalm Bombers or Lycos. I mean, Wyverns. Because the thing with Wyverns is that they would have been able to tear apart the Grizzlies without too much issue, or it would have been able to just tank all the defender shots, go in, tear apart the factory directly. And just stop it at the source. At that point, Anarchy just has to deal with the Grizzlies that exist. And then everything else is just a matter of crushing through with Zeus, Warrior, Rocco. That's it. Sharpshooters would be useful. But you wouldn't have to spam any more of them. Just power through with that. But yeah, the problem, of course, is that is a bit of a high-risk strategy. Because that requires waiting a couple minutes for the Wyvern to finish. And I... What? No, stream's not dead. Anyway, that is... Yeah, the Overrun would have been expensive. It's just that it's... Given that there were already four Grizzlies being built, Rymark had... Exp oh, sorry, Flipstep had already invested a lot in their economy. At that point, Anarchy and Flipstep were fairly even. So if Anarchy had kept their commander alive earlier, and from there, they would have been able to power up that whole air switch a little bit more easily. It's just Wyvern, I'm just thinking, that or enough Ravens. The problem is the Defenders. The problem is you can't tank Defenders with Ravens. You can with Wyverns, but not with Ravens. Just the problem is Wyverns are 2,000 metal while Ravens are 300, so it's a lot easier to justify building half a dozen Ravens, using them to power through and kill the factory in one volley, than it is to try to justify getting one Wyvern, which would power through and kill the factory in a volley or two. Actually, I think it's two volleys. And destroy most of the base as well. Still, Wyverns are, at that point, kind of the appropriate escalation option, to an extent. It's a bit tricky. I mean, Anarchy haven't been on the back foot. It's always tricky to figure out what to do on the back foot. I just... Yeah, it just seems like Flipstep really had a much more distributed army, had a much easier time dealing with more sides in the map. Anarchy was so focused on the northeast, and then from that point, so focused on their main base, they couldn't really push out from there. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. I guess I'm still talking to this people here. Okay, the thing with Wolverine is that, yes, it would have needed to kill the defenders to make cost, as it were. But killing the factory, I think, would have been a bigger thing to do. Like, you kill the factory, and you basically have air dominance to the point that you can kill whatever you want. So yeah, you could kill the defenders over here, for example, and open that up. Which should be done, sure. It's pretty nice splash damage. But stemming the tide of the Grizzlies... That, I think, would have already made... Considering how many Grizzlies were built, that several thousand metal worth of Grizzlies, that would not have existed. That would not have been a problem for Anarchy. And so, Wyvern's a bit of an odd value choice. It's hard to... Like, once you get to 2,000 metal or so, it's hard to justify in terms of is it going to make costs? It's almost more just justifying in terms of is it going to win you or lose you the game? Like, are you going to win the game for building it or not? It's... It's hard to judge in terms of cost-effectiveness when you're dealing with stuff that's that expensive. At least, I think it would be. I mean, maybe it's not. Maybe I'm wrong. But it seems like that's... It's... Are you going to win or are you going to lose? Are you going to live or are you going to die? If you're getting to the point where you're considering 2,000 metal units, seriously, you're actually at the point where you have the economy to afford that, you're also at the point in the game where 
a single 2,000 or 3,000 metal unit from your opponent is going to win them the game, or at least push it far enough that they can take all the advantages they need to win the game. Like, it's going to be the game-winning move. It's going to be their super move. They're going to throw it out there, and they're going to win, or they're going to lose, and it kind of depends on how you react to it. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. And... Okay, yes, that's that's a good point. The back foot thing makes it tricky. But the Wolverine also lasts for a while, so I could still see it. I mean, I don't see how Ravens would have been able to even get inside the base. That's the thing. Ravens simply wouldn't have been able to get over the defenders and survive. Which is kind of the problem. At least that seems to be the biggest problem, is being able to actually get in there at all. And Napalm Bombers wouldn't be able to destroy anything of this stuff either. They would have died too quickly. I mean, maybe they would have been able to burn out some of these defender lines, but it seems unlikely. And yeah, I'm kind of thinking what Grand Arbiter of Taste is thinking. It's just, you just... You have that as a thing that keeps attacking for a while. I mean, it deals the damage it needs to, and then it just goes around and deals all the rest of the damage it can, because it can survive long enough to do that. But anyway, that's not how it went down. So, what we saw is exactly how it did, in fact, go down. But anyway, that is going to be it. That is actually going to be it for me tonight. So, thank you everyone for watching, and as usual, I'm going to only do analysis on a single game, because that's how I typically do it. So, once again, thank you for watching, and before I go, though, I am going to make a couple of announcements. The Saturday after next, not the, not the coming Saturday, not the 22nd, but the 29th, there is going to be the regular monthly 1v1 tournament, or rather the regular monthly 0k tournament, which being November, it is 1v1. There is also the following weekend, December 6th, a 2v2 tournament. Parzival is doing this again. It's going to be once again like the last Parzival tournament, a Swiss style tournament. It is also going to be at 1700 UTC or 5 p.m. UTC or noon Eastern Standard Time, or in my case, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, while the regular 1v1 tournament is going to be... Anyway, the regular 1v1 tournament is going to be on... It's going to be on the 29th, like I said, and it's going to be at 9 a.m. UTC, at 0900 UTC, or 1 a.m. PST. So yes, once again, I'm getting up at a ridiculous time in the morning. No big deal. I've done it enough times, and I usually have sacked off Ander Flores helping me out, so that's fine. So, anyway, that is going to be it. All the announcements, everything done. So thank you for watching and have a good night, everyone.